Today is the fourth Sunday in Lent, known as Letare Sunday. The epistle for today's Mass is taken from the letter of St. Paul to the Galatians, chapter 4. Brethren, it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a slave girl and the other by a free woman. And the son of the slave girl was born according to the flesh, but the son of the free woman in virtue of the promise. This is said by way of allegory, for there are two covenants, one indeed from Mount Sinai, bringing forth children unto bondage, which is Agar, for Sinai is a mountain in Arabia which corresponds to the present Jerusalem and is in slavery with her children. But that Jerusalem which is above is free, which is our mother. For it is written, Rejoice, thou barren that does not bear. Break forth and cry, thou that does not travail. For many are the children of the desolate, more than of her that has a husband. Now we, brethren, are the children of promise, as Isaac was. But as then he who was born according to the flesh persecuted him who was born according to the Spirit, so also it is now. But what does the Scripture say? Cast out the slave girl and her son, for the son of the slave girl shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. <coughs> Therefore, brethren, we are not children of a slave girl, but of a f- the free woman, in virtue of the freedom wherewith Christ has made us free. <coughs> Please stand now for the Holy Gospel, which is from St. John, chapter 6. At that time, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is that of Tiberias. And there followed him a great crowd, because they witnessed the signs he worked on those who were sick. Jesus, therefore, went up the mountain and sat there with his disciples. Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was near. When, therefore, Jesus had lifted up his eyes and seen that a very great crowd had come to him, he said to Philip, Whence shall we buy bread that these may eat? But he said this to try him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered, Two hundred denarii worth of bread is not enough for them, that each one may receive a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, the brother of Simon Peter, said to him, There is a young boy here who has five barley loaves and two fishes. But what are these among so many? Jesus then said, make the people recline. Now there was much grass in the place. The men therefore reclined in number about 5,000. Jesus then took the loaves and when he had given thanks, distributed them to those reclining and likewise the fishes as much as they wished. But when they were filled, he said to his disciples, gather the fragments that are left over lest they be wasted. They therefore gathered them up and they filled 12 baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. When the people therefore had seen the sign which Jesus had worked, they said, This is indeed the prophet who has come into the world. So when Jesus perceived that they would come to take him by force and make him king, he fled again to the mountain himself alone. Thus far the words of today's Holy Gospel. Jesus then took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, distributed them to those reclining, and likewise the fishes as much as they wished. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. This beautiful story in the Gospel today is really connected to several other stories from John chapter 6. This is the beginning of the sixth chapter of John. And after this miracle, Jesus then will walk on the water to teach his disciples that he indeed is the Lord God, not just the prophet, but he is divine. And then the next day, he will institute the blessed sacrament. And the disciples, because of the 
signs that they saw Jesus work, the miracle of the multiplication of the bread and fish and the walking on the water. And even though everyone else was leaving Jesus when he said, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you will not have life in you. Jesus said to Peter and to all the apostles, do you also wish to go away? And Peter said for them all, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And we have come to believe and to know that thou art the Christ, the Son of God. Peter and the apostles had, the, had faith because they saw what Jesus had done. They truly believed he was the Son of God. But Jesus said, Do you believe? There is one here who has a devil. He was referring, of course, to Judas Iscariot, who even though Judas would stay with the apostles at this moment, he also, like the multitude, had rejected the doctrine of the Holy Eucharist. And so this Sunday, I want you to try to understand that the, the story of today's gospel, the multiplication of the bread and fish, is symbolic of our Lord giving to us the Holy Eucharist, the true bread that comes down from heaven. And so we should always consider that the Blessed Sacrament is the best preparation for us for Easter time. The Church requires that every single Catholic receive Holy Communion during the Easter season, which began on the first Sunday of Lent and goes to Trinity Sunday. Every single Catholic is obliged to make a worthy and devout Holy Communion during this time. Let's then prepare ourselves to make a very fervent Communion today. As part of the preparation for Communion, I want you to consider this crowd they had been with Jesus now for some time. They had been following him and listening to him preach. And they had no food. They were fasting. And that is how we also have to approach the Holy Eucharist. We have to be fasting. A lot of people forget that there is a physical preparation for the Holy Communion. Physically, we have to be fasting and we have to also be clean and well-dressed. When we see children approaching the communion rail that are dressed poorly, not wearing their best clothes, you know, just wearing, let's say, a t-shirt and tennis shoes, or you can see that their parents do not have the understanding of what this is the greatness of this moment. When you remind your children they have to dress up, and when you yourself dress up to go to Mass, it's because you are going to receive our Lord. I'm going to be united to the King of Kings. You may be poor, but there's no reason not to look your best and to be clean. And we also have to fast. You know that the law of the church up until 1950 was Catholics were to fast from midnight before communion, and they were not allowed to have anything, not even water. Pius XII relaxed that fast and made it three hours from food and alcohol and one hour from drink. Water and medicine could be taken at any time. And he did this because of the institution of the evening mass. When the fast from midnight became impossible. But Pius XII also said that he wished for Catholics who could to keep the traditional fast from midnight. How sad it is that 60 years later now, most Catholics don't fast at all. 
What I mean is that in the new church now, strictly speaking, the law is one hour from food and drink. Which means basically that you can be eating on your way to Mass. Is that any kind of preparation? I know that you probably would never do that. But I've often come across many people who say, well, you know, the fast is only one hour. Are we Novus Ordo Catholics? If we are traditional Catholics, we should keep the traditional laws. I know that, strictly speaking, the law is one hour. So it's not a question of sin, but it is something we should try to do to observe the traditional fast of three hours and when possible to observe the fast from midnight as Pope Pius XII asked. In that way we will be doing a penance and preparing ourselves physically to receive the Lord. Much like the crowd in today's gospel prepared themselves for the miracle by fasting. There's also a spiritual preparation that goes into receiving Holy Communion, of course. And that is the instruction that the crowd received before the miraculous multiplication of loaves and fish. They were instructed by our Lord, and the Church also would have us to be instructed before we receive Communion. That's why every Sunday, the priest is obliged to give a sermon. <coughs> I know that many times we, we sometimes think to ourselves that the sermon is too long or it's, you know, it's why does the priest have to preach? It's part of the instruction. It's for our soul's salvation. It's to prepare us that we might receive the Holy Eucharist with the greatest benefit. Another spiritual preparation is, of course, to be free from sin. You cannot approach Holy Communion if you have a mortal sin on your soul. Before our Lord distributed the miraculous bread and fish to the people, you'll notice that it says, he healed all those who were sick. Similarly, if we have sin on our souls, we must be healed first. Go to confession before you go to communion. If you have no serious sins on your soul, of course you can go to communion. But remember to say the confidior very devoutly. That's why we have the Confidior again in the Mass before Communion, because when properly said, it wipes away your venial sins. Pray the Confidior then with great devotion as you approach the Communion rail. Make acts of contrition so that you might receive our Lord with as pure a soul as possible. That your soul might be healed of its diseases. Now, when we approach the communion rail, we are taught by our catechism that we should be making acts of faith, hope, and charity. You'll notice that our Lord is also preparing the disciples, as it were, to elicit these same acts. He says to Philip, how are we going to feed the people? And Philip speaks very matter-of-factly that even 200 denarii is not enough to buy food for all these people. But you'll notice that Andrew has a glimmer of faith there. He says, there's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fishes. But then he sort of withdraws it and says, but what's that amongst so many? But I want you to understand something that our Lord was trying to remind the apostles that he could do it, that he could take care of the crowd. 
He wanted them to elicit an act of faith at that moment. Andrew did in a, in a small way, and so did the boy that gave his food to the apostles. He was showing that he was eliciting at least, you could say, an act of charity at that moment. Our Lord asks us to also have faith in him at the moment we're going to receive him in Holy Communion. You should recall, as I said, that he walked on the water. You should recall that he healed the sick, that he raised the dead, that he multiplied the bread and fish. This is the same Lord I'm going to receive now. What faith I should have in him. If he did those things, he can do anything for me. And that's why we say that beautiful prayer. Lord, I'm not worthy that you should enter under my roof. Only say the word and my soul will be healed. It's forcing you to elicit an act of faith. Lord, I know that you can do anything for me. And so make your acts an act of faith before you receive communion. Remind yourself that the, Jesus is God, that he is here present in this, in this host, and that I'm receiving the Lord of all creation who can do anything. We should also make acts of hope, confidence. You'll notice that our Lord, when he, he multiplied this food, it's similar to when he instituted the, I'm sorry, when he, he said the first mass and gave us the blessed sacrament. It says he took the loaves, he blessed them and gave thanks, distributed. It's very similar language to at the Last Supper. And I think that you should be reminded that you have to have confidence that our Lord is able to give you himself in the Holy Eucharist. He's able to, to be with you just as he gave himself to the apostles at the Last Supper, our Lord can multiply himself just as he multiplied the bread and fish. It's much like the sun. It shines into every window around the world, and its strength is never lessened. Every one of the six billion people in the world could take a magnifying glass and start a fire using the power of the sun. And yet, the sun's power would in no way be lessened. And so, have confidence in our Lord that even though he multiplies himself and gives himself to everyone, that one host that you receive is Jesus, whole and entire, God enters into you, and his power in no way is lessened, though he gives himself to everyone. Imagine how privileged you would feel if you were the only person able to receive Holy Communion. Well, it's the same. Our Lord gives himself to you, to one, in the same way as he gives himself to many, it in no way lessens his power. And also, that hose can be separated and broken, and you could even be given a small part of it and still receive the same Lord in all his power and glory. Much again like the sun in the sky, you could hold a mirror that reflects the power of that sun and you could break that mirror into a thousand pieces and each piece still would reflect the same powerful sun, just as powerful as the 
as the large mirror, that small piece still reflects the same power and might of the sun. And so you should never think to yourself, if the priest broke the host and gave you a small piece, you should never think, oh, I'm only receiving a small portion of our Lord. No, you're receiving Jesus Christ, the Lord God, entire. His body, blood, soul, and divinity. And then finally, you should be eliciting acts of faith, uh, acts of love and charity. When you receive communion, you're receiving the greatest gift possible. No greater love than this has anyone than to lay down his life for his friends. Jesus gave his life for us and he left himself in the Blessed Sacrament as a memorial of his passion. So when you receive Holy Communion, you should be thinking of the sacrifices that our Lord has done for you. And your heart should be full of love and gratitude. And that's why after you've received Jesus, you should be spending time in thanksgiving, in prayer, talking to him. It is the best time, of course, for prayer. It seems strange that many Catholics would, would rather pray elsewhere. They would go, rather go home right away after Mass and perhaps say some prayers or do some devotions there. But why would you do that when you have God inside of you right now? After communion, your prayers, as it were, are as powerful as the Blessed Mother's. For like Mary, you carry within you Jesus Christ. And so, as Our Lady's prayers are all powerful, in a certain sense, right after Holy Communion, so are yours. You will never have a time in your life better than that moment to receive the grace and blessings you wish to beg from God. Jesus dwells in you as in a tabernacle. Approximately 15 minutes, most theologians teach, the Blessed Sacrament remains inside of you. That's why you should stay in church for at least 15 minutes after you've received communion. The Mass continues, and so most of the 15 minutes is up when, it, when the Mass is over. But you should stay in church and make your thanksgiving after you've received our Lord. You all remember the story of St. Philip Neri when there was a man in his parish who kept leaving after Holy Communion. And St. Philip sent two acolytes to go after him carrying lit candles because the man was carrying the Blessed Sacrament, though he didn't seem to realize it. He got the message after that. So in the same way, when you've received Holy Communion, you should spend that time in church thanking our Lord. And whenever you do see a priest carrying the Blessed Sacrament in the street, you should kneel down. It's sad that often when I'm carrying the Blessed Sacrament, and you can tell when Father is carrying the Blessed Sacrament because he has, a, he has on his stole and he keeps his eyes down, his hands are usually at his breast, He's not waving to you or talking. It's because he's carrying our Lord. You should kneel down in reverence to the Blessed Sacrament. And in the same way, after you are carrying Jesus within you, you shouldn't be talking and, you know, spending time with your friends. That will come later. Right now, while Jesus is in you, you are quiet with your eyes cast down and you're speaking with him.
the Easter communion seems like such an easy thing for all Catholics to do. But do you know that there are many Catholics who do not receive Holy Communion? They neglect the Blessed Sacrament. You should remind them of what Jesus said, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you will not have life in you. Catholics who neglect the Holy Eucharist, who neglect their Easter duty, will not save their soul. It is a simple thing, but it is something that all of us need to do. The Church is making sure that we, she keeps us close to our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament. Every year she's saying you have to make a worthy and devout communion. Let's make our Easter communion then today by preparing ourselves very well for the reception of Jesus in the divine sacrament. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood abideth in me and I in him. And as St. Paul said, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives within me. It's an infallible sign that you've made a worthy communion if after you become a better person. Because it's our Lord now living within you. And even when the physical presence of the Blessed Sacrament is gone, His grace is still there from the Blessed Sacrament. If you would have to admit that you are no better after communion, then you have to look at how you are preparing yourself to receive Jesus. Are you practicing the devotions that I've said, physical, spiritual preparation? Are you eliciting acts of faith, hope, and love when you receive our Lord? Are you making a proper thanksgiving? If not, that is why you haven't become a better person. Let's then resolve to make every communion we can. Let's receive communion the second half of Lent as often as we can, even every day if possible, so that we will become a true disciple of our Lord. He who eats my flesh and drinketh my blood abides in me and I in him, and I will raise him up on the last day. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.